So, uh, let's check in. Hey, we're live, Jamie. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Dad. Did, uh, did, you, press, like did live. you press those yeah. buttons? On Facebook. Thanks. I didn't know anyone was there. Is anyone out there? Is anybody out there? I know people are out there. Is anybody watching us of those people that are out there? Oh, yeah, that's true. I think so. Yeah. It looks like looks like there could be a viewer. If you're out there, say hi. Let us know where you are. If you have a dog, if you're a Top Dog Academy member, we love, oh. love hearing from you. How are you doing today, Dad? I'm doing well. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I've been working all day. Had a very busy day getting things done. Um, and... Um, and I have a meeting after this, so we have to definitely end by 2.25. 2.25, okay, that's good to know. And um, it looks like it's just the two of us talking to each other. No, nope. Scott says hi. <laughs> hey, From Scott. Scary Maine, I think. Yeah. I think that's what There we go. Hey, Scott. Hey, Scott. Kittery. Hmm. Are you going to ask me how I'm doing? Um, how are you doing, Jamie? I'm doing well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, nothing too exciting going on here. Uh, I went uh, went to a friend's house last night. We played some some board games, including uh -huh. I think a simplified version of mahjong. Oh yeah. Oh, hello from Portugal. Hello, Helder. Here we go, Australia, South Africa. And Patty, who's from Hello. Hello. I know we, we switched it up a little this week with the Italians for Independence. With a slightly yeah. different time. Hmm? We switched it up a little bit. This Who said we have five people watching here on YouTube? I think that's Jess watching oh, yeah? in the other room in the office. Oh. Which uh, it says there's a total of 22 people watching all together. So it sounds like most are watching on Facebook. That's good. Oh, Hello Scott's a huge UK. fan of us both. Hey, Scott. That's all good. Right. So, yeah, today we're going to be talking about safe puppy socialization. And um, as per usual, today's seminar is today's webinar is brought to you by us. The Top Dog Academy, the Dunbar Academy. And if you are interested in checking out uh, the Dunbar Academy for yourself, you can use this link up here on the page uh, to try a free trial of the Top Dog Academy. And uh, I'm sure they all subscribe, Jamie. I think you're wasting oxygen here. Oh, I don't yeah. Think they all subscribe. I bet there's they do. some subscribers. Oh, I Today see. we've got some videos yeah. ready to. Uh, to show as part of the presentation. And those videos are taken from our all new essential puppy training course, uh, which is included in the Top Dog Academy. Are we gonna show the videos uh, first in the middle or at the end? What's the plan, Jamie? They'll come up. We're gonna start by talking about why puppy, social, puppy, socializ why puppy socialization is so important. So with that, Dad, why is puppy socialization so important? Um, well, it is. Probably, without... probably don't need to talk at length. I bet most people know, but I thought we'd just cover our base. No, I, I have so little to say today because this whole, you know, parvo socialization dilemma is just a non-dilemma. And I've been saying this for like, even before parvo, when we had, you know, distemper, a really dangerous disease with a horrible death. And I was talking about safe socialization. Yet people aren't doing it. Anyway, we'll get to that later. Why is it so important? Because it's the single biggest factor that influences and molds the dog's personality, temperament, perception towards people. Um, because today we're talking about socialization with people and um, people's environment, you know, the, the living space. And it's just, it's number one by far. The, you know, um, the, the only thing uh, which um, 
would surpass it, but I, I include it with socialization, would be bite inhibition. So when the dog learns, as all um, animals with weapons learn, or all mammalian animals with weapons at least, how to inhibit the force of their weapons with their own kind. And for those we domesticate, we have to teach them also inhibit your weapons with us, with people. And so we have to make sure a dog learns bite inhibition with other dogs. Well, that's a no brainer. You just take him to a puppy class and there's his first lesson, pretty indelible. They learn it from biting other puppies. Um, teaching them bite inhibition with people is slightly more difficult because there's a lot of advice out there. Stop your puppy biting and doing all these sort of, you know, pretty nasty aversive things to dogs to stop from biting. Well, if they don't bite, they can't learn that their teeth hurt. And so all may go well while they remain inhibited, but should you provoke them or frighten them or spook them to the point where they bite you, you're gonna have a hell of a bite for deep punctures. So I include bite inhibition in the whole socialization process because they will learn it naturally if they are around people. Because what do they want to do? They want to bite every person. And so we have to make sure now that people know the correct feedback to give. So we gradually reduce the force of the puppet's bites. And we do that before we phase out biting altogether. Yeah, I think, because, uh, I, think I could see us doing a webinar in the future entirely about bite inhibition. Seems like a it's it's a very yeah it's a misunderstood topic and the owners will probably get far more i think incorrect advice from useful advice there's so many breeders and veterinarians and dog trainers who say you know punish him when he bites you know grab his muscle hold it closed hit him with a rolled up newspaper squirt him in the face with lemon juice and all it's it's still out there which is scary Rather than saying, I was sitting outside the other day and uh, little Sam, who I'm forced to call him now, I don't want to call him squirrel. Um, and it's disturbing because his whole body's growing, but not his squirrel-like head. So uh, <laughs> I, I was looking at that picture you posted and I thought that's a wonderful perspective because he's really um, a large body, you know, like a seal or a mole with enormous paws, but I would say a smaller than usual head. But in the picture, because it's taken from above and he's sitting, he's got this enormous, great lion's head. And in the distance, we got these little pity paws, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know why I'm talking about that. Oh, yeah, we were outside. I was just sitting in a chair. She just peed and what have you, and, and I petted her, and then she gently took hold of my hand. And I sat there for five minutes praising her because she was gently mouthing it, you know, and then she gave a little squeeze, ow, worm. And then she looks at me, you know, and then she starts holding my hand again and mouthing. You know, the longer you do that, the more your hand is in the puppy's jaws, the safer its jaws will be as an adult dog. Um, it's huge. So, yeah, that's a whole webinar in itself. But the socialization thing, it, um, it's regardless of breed and breeding, because everyone talks about breed, oh, you know, you don't understand, Ian, this is a da-da. And then they tell me it can't be trained or it won't sit on cue or it will always be a little dodgy with men or what have you, it's standoffish. We go on and on and on because of the breed. And then, of course, we get into the breeding. Oh, I've been breeding for temperament. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what that would take? I know you're not doing it because it would take ruthless culling uh, over 20 generations minimum. And even a well-established breeder, they may have had 20 litters, but they haven't had 20 generations. If they had, then they're certainly breeding male dogs much too early. You know, we have to breed the bitches earlier. And so, no, you, um, what is it, Julie Case says, um, nature provides a puppy, you create your dog. And, and that's what it is, that um, for so many reasons, it is such the most important, you know, aspect of uh, uh, breeding, husbandry, and training 
you know, the second two dogs breed, you know, when the male's humping the female, that's it. The gene team has now made its one Hail Mary play, and we hope it's a good one because now those little sperm are on their way to the, you know, who was site, and soon we're going to have uh, a zygote, and that's it. What are you going to do about genes now? Well, all you can do is uh, cull, you know, euthanize or neuter, castrate or spay, um, but you can't, like, yeah, we will soon be able to modify the dog's genes and say, oh, I want a Bernese uh, like a Malinois. I want an ultra fast one or something, and that will be we'll put in those little Malinois genes, you know. Right, but um, the point is, you you can't modify the genes once you've got a puppy now. No, but what you can do is socialize them. It's the only thing you can do, and socializing and like, has a huge impact on on the dog's temperament. The impact is huge. So I could draw a little virtual illustration. If you compare the difference, say, between a golden retriever and a Malamute. Because a golden is not a Malamute. The Malamute's not a golden. I don't deny genetics. There are differences. So let's say the difference on any variable you choose is this big. Let's now compare socialized dogs and unsocialized dogs. Well, the difference is like this, the height of the Empire State Building. Now at the bottom, you've got Goldens and Malamutes with that difference. At the top, you've got Goldens and Malamutes with that breed difference. But the difference between being socialized and unsocialized is everything. And it influences the whole quality of life, uh, not just for the dogs, but for the owners too. If you've got a tricky temperament, the dogs that are scared of children, say, or men wearing hats or other dogs, now a walk becomes worrying until eventually the walk becomes no walks, you know, but now visitors can't come to your house. It impacts so much on, on quality of life. So the benefits of socialization are huge. What are the risks? Um, well, what are the risks? I don't know. You could be socializing a dog and a great big flower pot could topple over and crush the puppy. No, the point is there's risks in everything. But I think what you're getting at is what are the parvo risks? You know, um, well, next to none, if you're doing socialization safely. You see, this whole, again, we get back to the whole vaccination and parvo, you know, constraint on socialization. It should have been a non-issue. Yet to this day, um, there's still a lot of veterinarians out there there's still a lot of books. There's still a lot of breeders who say, don't go to puppy class till you've had your full series of puppy shops. Um, at which point, the critical period of socialization is history by about a month and a half. When, what does that mean? Well, the critical period of socialization, it's a very old term coined by uh, John Paul Scott and John Fuller. This is the period when a young puppy is most receptive to taking in its environment and progressively desensitizing itself to novel stimuli. So basically it goes like this. In the process of socialization, we have precocious animals like say geese or horses, you know, foals and, and, and calves. And these socialize in about 24 hours. And basically what happens is during the first one to two days of life, they're receptive to everything. And if anything moves in their environment, they will follow it. You've all seen Lorenz's geese, right? Following him. Because when they came out of the eggs, he was, he was there. Hello, goslings, he said, and walked away from them. And they little trotted after him. They did it for the rest of their life. So that's with a precocious animal. But humans and dogs and cats are altrical meaning they take several months um, and, and sometimes a year and a half with dogs to reach maturity, uh, with humans, of course, a good seven decades before the human male reaches maturity. Um, so we have the initial period, a young puppy or kitten will approach anything. And if they approach it, 
that becomes part of their normal environment. Once a certain time is up, now their strongest tendency is not to approach. They're no longer universal approaches, if you like. They now tend to avoid. Until in dogs, by the time they're six to eight months old, they're now going to avoid anything that is unfamiliar. So this obviously works well in the wild because the only animals that they see during the first, say, 10 weeks of life, maybe three months, is mum and litter mates. You know, they're not even coming out of the den in the wild until they're seven to eight weeks. And if anything goes wrong, they see anything, you know, there's a cheetah, whoom, they're back underground again with mum and litter mates. So it's you get used to and will con continue accepting what you've got used to in puppyhood. But you will avoid and sometimes find excruciatingly frightening just the unfamiliar, a person you don't know, a dog you don't know. So, so that's basically the, the process. But so that's the benefit of socialization. But I was asking you about the, the risks of socialization. And you, you brought up PARPO as being the main risk that people are worried about and said it should be a, a non-issue. But I think that you would agree that, that PARVO is a, a serious disease and you don't want oh, your yeah. puppy to get PARVO. Yeah. I, so, I think when veterinarians give advice, they usually just tell you what not to do with the puppy. They say, keep it home. Don't go anywhere with the puppy um, until it's completed its series of shots. Now, of course, they neglect to say a number of things. For example, don't walk your puppy from the car to the vet clinic probably the most dangerous place to be in terms of viral load. Keep him on your lap in the waiting room. Carry him to the exam table. So how can they neglect to warn you of the most dangerous place you could ever go um, with a young puppy, the place where sick dogs go? But also, they, they must know by now about socialization especially in certain countries in the world now where the oath they swear as a veterinarian is to care for uh, behavioral health as well as physical health. They must know socialization is important and critical for horses. You know, if they're not handled in 24 hours, I mean, they're a very flighty and large animal. So what they should be telling owners is here's what you should do. The number one most urgent item on your puppy training agenda is house training, chew toy training, and starting to teach your puppy to enjoy little times at home alone so he doesn't develop separation anxiety when he's eight months old. Number two, socialization with people. But people are largely hung up about socialization with dogs. That's why they think they go to puppy class. They think it's, they're off leash because the puppies can play with each other. No, they're off leash when they get to puppy class so the puppies can interact with every other person in class. That's 24 people who will interact with, handle and train the puppies. The, the dog dog socialization can be put on hold easily because for the first eight weeks of a puppy's life, all he did when he was awake, after one second for toilet duties, and then suckling when he falls asleep, is chase and bite other puppies. Their bite inhibition is well underway, you know, it's starting the training, they are well socialized, and they can withstand a social doggy vacuum for four weeks because the first night in puppy class, boom, boom, we bump start all dogs. There may be one that's a little scared out of, say, 12 puppies, but otherwise the other 11 are getting back into it again. But we cannot have this social vacuum with people. It's far too important because we're going to take the dog into the world of people where there's children, where there's adults, you know, strangers and so on. And so what vets should be telling people, what breeders should be telling people, when you get home, household manners first, you know, take three to four days to do that, and then your house should be party central. No, you can't take a puppy who's not fully vaccinated to dangerous areas. Like I said, the ground outside of the veterinary clinic or the ground in low income areas. 
Low income means low vaccination, which means high parvo, which means a high viral load um, on the ground. And we have also uh, viruses and bacteria coming out in the urine. So pup, uh, urine and feces are how it's spread. And we can actually bring it in our house by walking those areas and tracking through the house with our shoes, a, a sort of formidic infection, if you like, um, that inanimate objects can carry virus. And so they should explain that, you know, do do the, the quick household manners and then everything is about people's socialization. I would still maintain, I mean, I'm a veterinarian. Of course I would say, hey, vaccinate your puppy and what I'm looking for a, a good immunity to come to puppy class is you've had two shots after eight weeks of age at least two weeks apart and one week later I'm happy you've got sufficient immunity to be in a fairly safe place at least a hundred times safer than the waiting room of a vet clinic um, so I want the puppy to have his shots. I want people coming to the house to take their shoes off or just wear little shoe covers, you know, those disposable things that we wear, doctors and vets wear when they're operating. And it's just party central. Everybody handles the puppy. We're handing out food treats like there's no end of them. Okay, I want the puppy to think, God, I love it when these visitors come in. The owners are so stingy, they expect, you know, five puppy push-ups for every treat. But they, these are people, they go, ooh, ah, and give me a treat. Then they handle all of the um, seven tactile, you know, subliminal bite spots on the dog. And then, of course, the people fulfill, what is it, the other five. The only one left would be value objects. Well, we do that. So we're playing with the puppy with squeaky toys and tuck toys. It's socialization. And I always say as a rule of thumb, and, and this is where, um, I mean, I, I, sorry, I've been talking about this forever, Jamie. Before I started puppy classes, when I was a vet student, why are vets saying don't take your dogs anywhere? Because it's really changed dogs how we've cut down the places they can go now but instructions from breeders and vets saying, don't socialize your puppy. You know, I can still remember when I grew up, puppies went everywhere. And there were dangerous diseases out there like distemper. Um, and so I always say as a rule of thumb, you know, yes, we want the pups to meet a lot of people at the breeding kennel. <laughs> well, um, it's probably not too many, I would say, two or three would be the average uh, outside of the family members at the breeding kennel. Um, uh, having said that, there will, of course, be some breeders who I know. I, I knew a golden breeder in San Francisco. She had the puppies, um, like the whelping box and the puppy run, in the middle of her living room, tarpauling underneath. She lived in Pacific Heights. I mean, this was a fancy house. And she had a party, cocktail party, three nights a week. Man, these golden retrievers got so socialized and they were the center of attention. They heard sounds, people swearing, falling over, the vacuum cleaner, loud noises, you know, and so on and so on. They hadn't even left the breeding kennel yet or their yeah. Pacific Heights domain. But I always tell people, as a rule of thumb, a hundred different people between eight and 12 weeks and people just look at me in horror. I mean, I could do that in a week. Remember you asked me, Dad, let's start off with a little story before we talk about this. I said, yeah, let's tell the story of Dune's first day with us. And he was a little younger than eight weeks. And we picked him up in Pennsylvania um, because uh, Kelly and I were giving a um, open paw conference there. So the breeder arrives about midday and we take the little puppy and then we give him to someone in the front row and he's passed around the room. Well, the audience was 150 and they all wanted their time. And we told them, you know, uh, keep putting him down in his pee pads, you know. And then we went to the airport and everyone who saw him as we walked him, he's in our arms, you know, walking through the airport, wanted to pet him. Then we'd upgraded to first class. So the first 
class lounge, you know. Then we get on the plane. The first person to say hello to him is the captain who comes out of the co- you know, cockpit. Oh, wow, he's wonderful. And one by one, people will come up for a pet. And we estimated he had been handled by over 200 people, and we hadn't even had him for 12 hours, which is important because a lot of breeders say, um, oh, don't overdo it. Or what about the ENS stuff? You know, the early neurological stimulation stuff. If you actually go online and read those exercises, it says only once a day, do this. There's five exercises, no more than five seconds for each one. (laughs) I mean, this is insanity. It is so wrong. It is so stupid. Because there is no, you can't overdo it. You can't overdo it because the puppets pass out and fall asleep. And then they're like, rag dolls and jelly and then they wake up and they're energized again i mean i would not be overly like uh, even with a neonatal puppy i wouldn't go boom like that however that is the time to expose it to loud noises because it can't hear too well and it can't see too well hardly at all so that's when you start explode exposing them to sudden movements and and the sounds um but if the dog reacts um that's you, you have to see that to know what the puppy's temperament is yeah. it's no good just progressively desensitizing the dog to everything so it doesn't react you need to know if your dog is spooked shocked frightened how quickly does he get over it that's a very good indicator um, for dogs that are cool in big families we call that the bounce back time so, so i wanted to show uh one of these uh videos got a couple videos lined up <laughs> Um, and I thought, uh, we'd start with the one with the kind of socialization that you can do at home, introducing your puppy to new people, uh, starting with, you know, just one visitor and then hitting the important categories of children, uh, men, you know, unfamiliar men, uh, dogs, and, um, and then having a puppy party, which of course is your opportunity to socialize to lots of people. And how if you do these things outside, um, you can do them in a way that's uh, very safe from a COVID perspective. You can have social distancing. If you um, do it in a private yard, you know you can have it safe from parvo exposure. But uh, why don't I play this video and then uh, we can talk about it a little more. I'll put on my earphones so I don't give you feedback. Okay. See if I can get her to. Oh, not that one. There we go. Got her kibble Got here. Her kibble here. And you know, she's so she's seeing a new person, she's smelling a new person, she's climbing on a new person, and that person is feeding her in this case because she's such an outgoing and food motivated puppy. New people. Does, this also gives her an opportunity to again not go to the kids if she doesn't want to, or the new person doesn't have to be a child. Um, but we're giving her the idea here, the um, that new people, especially children, are super fun and friendly and this is a lesson that will stick with her and what you just try to avoid is a big giant pounce and smack down sometimes what i'll do is once i see that the puppy is excited is i might do this come here come here oh my goodness i might do a little lap sniff that's okay i think molly is gonna be okay but this way the puppy isn't just running amok the adult dog can give a nice sniff and here comes eve Say hi, everybody! (laughs) No one told me a puppy would be at this party. She's gonna get you! She's gonna get you! She licked my cheek! She likes to kiss you, doesn't she? She does that every time. Yeah. How about this? (laughs) Yeah. Cute little otter face. Some people say say they look like otters. So were you able to see it that time, Dad? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw it last time, remember? It's just yep. I couldn't hear you talking for some reason. You Maybe can't. when I... I hear you talking if you're off the screen. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, it was very odd. The first time we tried to show a video, you couldn't see it no, for some reason. No, that unexpected. did not work. But this time but, I'm on Chrome. Yeah. 
And so I get it in the video, you know, it was obviously towards um, the end or in the middle of COVID. So, uh, and that's why it's outside um, uh, for the people and uh, they're in their little family units or fairly distance. But, you know, the whole thing when COVID came up, remember, I mean, this is the fourth webinar we've done on this subject, wasn't it, Jamie? Right after COVID, I said that doesn't stop socialization. You know, you can stay in your um, like front yard with your puppy on leash and um, six foot leash. And so you now can precisely distance yourself six feet away from anyone who comes in one at a time to greet the puppy and pick it up and give it kisses and what have you. And I guess it's the way we tend to look at problems. A lot of people, and I remember when I, I wrote my first book, Dog Behavior, I had a wonderful cartoon where a man, a Paleolithic man and his Paleolithic dog were walking through a desert and there's an enormous rock. And the man says, because he's, you know, intelligent, he's human. He says, well, let's see how the human cerebrum deals with this problem. And the dog just walked around the rock and says, problem, what problem? But this whole thing about Parvo and then about COVID, why on earth should this stop us socializing our dogs, especially when it's so important? And I can't understand, especially given the fact this is our fourth webinar on this topic, why more vets hadn't got the message telling all owners, you know, well, you come here, ring the doorbell, uh, we'll be masked, we take a puppy from you, take it back. But then they should say to them, you must make sure this puppy is socialized to people, you know. We did our best in the clinic, all of us cuddled it and hand fed it treats, but you've got to do the same safely. The puppy mustn't hit the ground in, you know, infected areas and the people mustn't come close. Otherwise, there's no different. There's no different. Bring the people to the puppy in a safe place. Or yeah, I mean, I think puppy. it's easy to imagine how uh, veterinarians and breeders probably, you know, everyone's attuned to different types of risk. And like, I think what we've all learned in the past few years is like balancing and managing different types of risk is a complicated thing that people don't always do in a very rational way. And there are some types of risk that are inherently scarier to people. You know, like people are afraid of of uh, tigers in a way that they're not afraid of getting hit by a car or of dying <laughs> of lung cancer. You know, yeah. there, are, there are a lot of things we should be afraid of that we're not afraid of. Instead, we're afraid of other things like shark attacks when, you know, 10 people get eaten by sharks all year. And so when it comes to breeders and vets, you know, I think in, in part, it's kind of the incentive structure around them but like they really don't want their clients to get parvo based on their advice so they're super conservative about that whereas if their clients end up with dogs that are under socialized they don't feel like they're going to get blamed in the same way now i'm not saying that's the way it should be i'm just trying to put myself you know in the mindset of figuring out why are we having so much resistance getting vets to adopt a more uh, rational approach to the risk around socialization and parvo and and trying to figure out like where are they coming from because that's the only way we're going to successfully you know come up with the messages that will convince them i think there's two things one um <laughs> even veterinarians you know get scared of some viruses if you remember canine flu the outbreak which nearly shut down uh, uh, puppy business. And so I got on the phone and I contacted the researcher who had, um, you know, collected up all these numbers. And I said, well, how many dogs have died? And he says, oh, well, there were nine greyhounds in uh, Florida. I said, yeah, but they were euthanized. We don't know they died of canine influenza because there was no test for it. But these dogs were euthanized. And so we went through all the cases and I pulled out the numbers, number of dogs diagnosed. Now, we don't know that for certain, but OK, a vet says this dog has canine influenza. Point one of suspected cases died. So not even, you know, it was one in a thousand. Um, and when we look at Parvo, uh, 
also, when we're realistic, when I used to give my vet seminars, I would always uh, survey the room and I said, right, I want you, um, when I scan the room, I want you to shout out how many puppies have died of parvovirus in your clinic in the past year. And it pretty much goes like this. 00110001129 So most vets are good. Oh, 95% of vets say zero or one. Okay. Occasionally a vet will say 20 or 30 or 40. And so I single them out and I ask them, do you work in a shelter? Most of them do. Do you work in a very low income area with a high viral load? and not sufficient funds to pay for treatment. So parvo is a virus that's highly infectious, but it seldom kills dogs. And if the dogs die, it's usually because the owners couldn't afford treatment. I mean, these are just the facts. Do we need to be careful of it? Yes, you know, I feel the same about COVID. I consider it my responsibility to get vaccinated to decrease the viral load in society. That's my own opinion. You know, um, and I think the same with these doggy diseases. But I think the second thing the vets don't realize is this safe socialization. How could that be harmful suggesting owners do something that is 99.999% safe and nowhere near the risk of the dog coming to their vet clinic? I mean, yeah. that's what and I think. I think that's definitely the more going to be the more productive approach is right focusing on safe socialization i definitely don't think you know calling uh parvo a non-issue like that that's going to make people think that we're not you know considering it a an important problem oh but it's focusing no, of course on it is sorry jamie i'm a veterinarian you know it's a disease we want the puppy we don't want the puppy to catch parvo definitely not the stemper definitely not leptospirosis but of those three parvo would be i think you know, the least risk to the dog. But no, we want it to have its immunizations. We don't want to take it anywhere. All I'm saying is people should make quite clear to owners what is safe and what is unsafe. Your house is relatively safe. Is it 100% safe? No, not if you're walking in the house with your outdoor shoes on. You could have trodden in right in some infected doggy doo-doo and yeah. now tracked it into your house where you have a young puppy. So it's all about decreasing, you know, the, right. the risk. And it seems like there's really just a, a handful of little tips that people need to understand about safely socializing their dogs. Oh, yeah. yeah. Puppy. And it's keeping them off the ground, especially in areas where there's a likelihood that there are unvaccinated dogs with parvo. It's keeping outdoor shoes outside. And I feel like based on what you were saying with the veterinarians and then also on, on, on Facebook, we posted a a question asking about people how much you know anecdotally people know of uh dogs that have gotten parvo there's a huge range but again it seemed like the range was very much about two things whether or not these were rescue dogs and whether or not and and geographic location and uh, i think chris um one of our viewers pointed out like the number one important question is what is the prevalence of disease in the local area and I think that's another really valuable point for people. Or local building. Is it a vet clinic or a shelter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that like, right, the, in terms of managing risk, you know, like there are some places, there are some buildings, your home, there are some, you know, neighborhoods where the prevalence of parvo is incredibly low and the risk therefore is similarly low. And then there's other places where it's very high and you really have to be very careful to keep your pup off the ground in those places um and so one of the one of the big things that you can do for socialization besides having people come to your home but is going bring your pup out into the world safely like you did with dune um and so the tips there are really just to keep your pup off the ground right yeah well dune probably had still a good deal of maternal you know passive immunity so um, he, he was younger than eight weeks. So wasn't the, the real risky times are eight weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks, when the maternal immunity has, has now disappeared. 
but the, we don't have the acquired immunity yet. So, you know, there's a, a, a time right after the owners get the puppy where, no, we don't really want to have it outside and walking. I would say because you have so much to do at home. I would say concentrate on keeping household manners because you don't want a dog that soils the house, chews everything and barks all the time and freaks out when left at home alone. So let's concentrate on that for say four days or a week, then safe socialization with people at home. And you wanna be specific who you invite. You gotta think ahead, who will be coming into the house that the dog hasn't met say in a year's time. Uh, it's usually your sister or brother's kids. So let's invite them now for a meet and greet the puppy party. Let's have everyone come like a Thanksgiving because we got the puppy rather than the usual time. And everyone in the extended family, uh, friends, neighbors, that's who you want to invite. The people who this dog will encounter in your like extended social group. And you tell everyone and bring a friend, you know, because they may come back the next week. Well, we aren't trying to train the puppy how to greet old friends in a manly fashion without freaking out. We, we try to train the puppy to welcome a stranger into its life and to know to go up to them and to sit and be petted. And strangers are cool because they always have the best training treats. Everyone else is using kibble, but the children and strangers and men with beards are given specially tasty training treats, healthy, but, but, but you know, scrumptious. And um, yeah, I mean, this is why I have, I sometimes have difficulty understanding things because I don't see the problem. This to me is a rock in the middle of the desert. Let's walk around it. There's a hundred different ways that we could safely socialize our dogs um, in COVID, <laughs> so being, you know, keeping ourselves safe, our dogs safe, but socialize them given how important it is. But I think there's a third issue with, with veterinarians that they are of the dog professions, they probably do the most CE and you know they know the value of learning and keeping up. And 20 years ago, vets would have known all this stuff because behavior and socialization was the flavor of the month at veterinary conferences. I mean, I know because I gave so many of the lectures myself. And so vets back then were pretty savvy that you can socialize safely. Not now, the most recent flavor of the month at vet conferences is um, stress-free handling. Well, so here we have now a lot of younger vets who we create the problem passively, but who's meant to tell owners? You know, your, your mailman? No, surely it should be the dog breeder the dog's veterinarian who, who's the custodian of your dog's health and they tell you about safe socialization. So passively, I think they're creating the COVID dog problem as we call it now. Um, by not telling them you can safely socialize, you know, and take parvo precautions and COVID precautions, but they don't do it because rather we will practice safe uh handling stress-free handling so we don't get bitten it's it's insanity if you had a dog that had been socialized you could do what you like to it pick him up plonk him on the table look in his ear oh got to cut your toenails and clean your teeth while you're here and the dog's like oh no i love this when do i get my my treats oh i'm gonna have treats after having my teeth cleaned and you're not gonna have to clean them again but you know and instead no we would rather do nothing to prevent the problem and then have to learn specialized, very careful handling techniques, not to stress the dog so we don't get bitten. Um, I, I really do think, I mean, you, you know this, how many times have I, I, we've gone on with our, let's educate the dog professions thing. Um, it was the two little dog books. The second time was the serious initiative. So what was that 20 years ago? And then when we, did um and that's still on done uh, dog star daily right and then dunbar academy we did an initiative for all of the five dog professions it's just my tips i think if you did this your pet store your 
breeding kennel, your veterinary clinic would be a happier place, you'd have more fun, and you'd have a lot more happy clients. And if you care about such things, and you would make lots more money, which I'm sure they would in pet stores. But how come these three, or shelters, you know, wouldn't you think if you have to deal with unwanted dogs, and you're exposed to dogs, and you know a lot of them are not going to make it, that you would want to prevent that? That the fifty percent of your budget should not be send us more money so we can build a better building, you know. It should be fifty percent of the money into how to prevent your dog from becoming a shelter dog. Yeah, I mean, I think what our experience reveals is that it takes more than uh, impassioned pleas and you know substantial text documents that like we've got to make ways to make this information attractive and engaging for people um so that it's easy to absorb you know i think we're we are increasingly entering a world where people's attention spans are short there are a lot of competitions for you know what people are going to listen to there's in the world of dogs there's often conflicting advice and things like you know captivating video uh good graphics you know like presenting things makes a difference. And I think maybe that's where we need to step up our game in terms of making these concepts uh, more readily shared and therefore more likely to get you know taken up. I so, totally agree with you there. Ryan. I think the video we showed last week, last week was very graphic. I mean, when you saw poor little Neville, it was shocking that I thought people are going to be you know, abusers of abuse but then when you see him towards the end of the first week and then the second week, the third week, and you realize he has now made friends with the dog that fought with all the puppies. So here's the, just one little video showing, hey, we had a dog that had four fights in his first week and we turned him into the best dog socially. Of course, he was the one that brought the poor scaredy cat Neville you know, out of his shell and now he was normal. And I think we have to, we, and, and we are doing this now. We're making more of these before and after videos, short clips. This was the dog before. You haven't seen the training. Here's the dog after. Do you want to know how we did this? Well, we also put up the non-edited version so you can see the training in real time. You know, words just don't do it. And I think passion, um, I have to stop myself because there are very few things that get me angry and I, you know that jamie i i hate arguing um but sometimes pure shameful cruel idiocy gets me angry but then no one's going to listen to me because my face turns into a vicious killer and so words won't do it and especially getting angry or preachy won't do it um and so I think it's video and it has to yeah. be, do you want this or this? I mean, I think one of the uh, biggest, best things that we've done in the past year towards all these things is the creating the essential puppy training course and creating, you know, a series of course with very easy to follow step-by-step -step demo videos that break it down very simply, you know, and show you how to socialize a puppy. You know, like I think, it's always going to be a struggle reaching the breeders and the veterinarians and getting them to, to pass the message along that we want. And that, you know, by reaching directly to the public, the, you know, the puppy training public, that hopefully we can, you know, foster the sort of demand. Um, with that in mind, I wanted to show another set of uh, excerpts from the Essential Puppy Training course. Uh, and this one's all about outings and uh, outings? outings, taking your pup out into the world. Yeah. Field trips, um, so that your puppy can see. Are we going to see the different Jamie video? Uh, we can. Yes. Um, yeah, I want to see uh, that. Or, you want to do that one first? Yeah. So this one, then we'll be focusing on the you know desensitization and socialization stuff that anyone can easily do with their puppy at home, um, without even really inviting anyone else over. Just you know the friends and family that are in your home. So let's see. Got this here. I will hide us and press play. Got her kibble here. Wait a second. With people at home. Not that one. Never mind. Hide that one. Show this one. 
There we go. So yeah, we'll start with um, desensitization to some substrates and then a variety of other things. All right, here we go. I'm into the ball pit. I'm into the ball pit. You have to figure out how to navigate that while she hunts for the treats. No pressure, but definitely enticement and encouragement. I stay right here with my puppy in case she gets in a jam. Um, take advantage of the fact that she's a puppy and puppies are often curious more than fearful at a young age. And so I'm just going to take advantage of that. And she is just committed to having her food. Very good. Well, I think we can up the ante then by adding another exciting little treat. Which makes noise and also produces bubbles! Mini balloons! <laughs> what do you think of that? She's very curious about it. I'm going to let her explore that for a minute. Hey, puppy pups. What is that? Good girl. Isn't that fun? So the noise of the machine, the fan of the bubble machine isn't bothering her. And uh, she's just curious about the bubbles as a nice, behaviorally healthy puppy should be. So today we've got our volunteer. And uh, let's see what, what Jamie comes up with. Oh, generic green muscle man. Squish Who's puppy. that? <laughs> Who's that? Oh. Well, she's looking at him. I'm going to hand feed her a little bit as he's acting a little different than he normally acts. Even though she's met Jamie before, she definitely notices that he's different. So come over gently and act a little more normal. No. But she seems just excited. She's Jamie. I've got my, the puppy in my lap for this exercise so she feels secure. Now I can see if she wants to follow the green giant yeah. around. Hey. Good. Free. Gonna have her Notice the stroller go by. Yeah, good puppy. And then come over, call her away, because there's no reaction. I mean, obviously she noticed it. Good girl. And free. <sighs> well, like, pop, pop, pops. Something happens. Oh, whoa, now this. Pop, 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 Eve, come. Oh, good girl. That was a hard one. Is that is something to chase for sure. I have an extra special treat in here. I have Kimba Papa Puppy and some meaty bits for such a hard distraction. For such a hard distraction. Video. So, a video playback on there no seemed a, li I mean, a little... Oh, girl! Oh, man. Yeah, the video playback on there was a little weird. I don't know. Did it that, was fine. Did that come it, through the right way for you, Dad? It started flashing light blue and black. Okay, yeah. It seemed like it was maybe repeating or something. I'm not 100% sure, but hopefully what you people saw was desensitizing a puppy to funny objects, you know, bubbles, balloons, and then putting on some costumes, acting weird, because that is the sort of thing that, you know, your dog might encounter later in life. And so you expose it, your puppy to it while they're young and they realize, hey, no big deal when someone puts on a silly costume. We actually have had a couple of other costumes with uh, crutches and, uh, you know, musical instruments. It didn't make it into that video. Anyway, I mean, you saw what just um, Kelly and Jamie did there. You know, imagine if we're inviting eight people to our house for a cocktail evening and everyone dresses up and everyone brings a friend and they all have to walk funny ways. Now, we'll have one of two types of comment, like when Jamie was the Hulk or whatever he was, the Jolly Green, I don't know. Well, I was I was a non uh, copyrighted uh, green muscle. Okay, uh, you will say, 
oh yeah well the puppy didn't care and you think you've wasted your time no you haven't um it's great the puppy didn't care about that and it happily took food from the the green giant um but that also has an effect of making the puppy more confident around Jamie dressed in this weird costume. And that comes into play once adolescence hits and the dog now is start, gonna start to become worried or spooked by just minor changes in the environment or, or people's experiences, like a, a cat. Like I walked into the room with something in my hand the other day, the cat froze and sat and looked at me like, I said, I've got something in my hand, Elsie. And when she heard me talk, she thought, oh, it's you. But I mean, that's how animals are. So the fact there's no reaction doesn't mean to say we haven't done anything. No, as we build up to adolescence, we want to be doing this on a regular basis. The other type of reaction. Yeah, so in the essential. Sorry. The other type of reaction you would get, um, which I hope we were going to see, um was the puppy's reaction to the penguin the dancing singing penguin now this is truly scary for some adults too um and it did spook the dog and that's important to see because now you know how something really stupid can spook your dog but you then work with it offer a bunch of food treats don't move the object, give the dog the opportunity to retreat and approach at its own speed, like Kelly was doing with walking over the crinkle wrap and then through the little, you know, uh, balls. The pup can take as long as he likes, but you know what, there's treats in there and that puppy won't be phased and soon it will be piling in to get the treats. And so the fact the dog reacted, um, that's cool because we then see how quickly we get the puppy over this, and that's what you want in a good dog, good bounce back. You will never have an unspookable dog because socialization to the environment is just too complicated. There's so many things out there you won't have thought of, but you can do an awful lot with just yourself. Costumes, weird gates is the thing that spooks dogs as they get older, falling down weird screamy noises so why don't you just try screaming falling flat on your face and kicking your arms and legs in the air you will get a reaction i would say with your german shepherd best to do it when it's eight weeks old than wait until it's eight months old <laughs> so um you, you just can't do too much you should be aware if the puppy seems to be fearful and backing off but all the more reason to continue, not stop. I've seen advice saying, oh, then don't, don't use the vacuum cleaner again. Duh. What if you're out of town and someone's staying at the house, a stranger, a man, and they get out the vacuum? Now, it's not just the vacuum, it's a scary guy driving it too. Your dog will fall apart. Whenever you see any fear, any crack in your dog's temperament, we got to deal with it right away. And the neat thing is about puppyhood, it's so quick. A young puppy, all the kibble from its dinner, you're pretty much going to resolve every problem that, that crops up. Yeah, I mean, with Eve, it was very interesting. We did so many preventative socialization, desensitization exercises where she had seemed uh, completely unfazed by anything. You know, we took her on many outings, uh, exposed her to novel stimulus, you know, had the puppy party where we had, you know, people wearing costumes, people with funny props, um, things like that. We did a whole series introducing her to a vacuum. And then, as you point out, there was the animatronic dancing penguin. Mm -hmm. And uh, she spooked. Um, you know, we, we clearly had her a little too close to it when we turned it on for the first time, and it startled her. And that, and it also, you know, she was older at that point. So that could have also been part of it. You know, she's getting into a different de developmental stage. But um, it definitely, it was remarkable how much, how many sessions it took to kind of get her back from being spooked by the penguin, uh, as opposed to all of these other situations where by doing it preventatively, doing it proactively, uh, there was no reaction, no fear at all. Uh, so it was, and really, it was very, really, very interesting. 
illustrates i, I think the uh, the spooky penguin who, who is really object i actually bought it um as a present yeah and we're, i think we'll do a, a webinar specifically about that about and spooky about penguin well it just about shows rehabilitating you how dog. unexpected these things are which emphasizes the importance of be for 12 weeks you must have lots of children come to the safe environment of your house because children will bring along all sorts of stuff like that and their children and just one exposure to you know eight children dressed up and they each bring three items and oh i can't explain the gift of confidence that you've given to your puppy and the quality of life improvement so that's why i love the the speaker for hugo because hugo had attended lots of puppy classes because i wanted to film them and he was a well socialized dog and then we went to calistoga one day and he was now i would say 14 weeks old and we're walking uh, to a restaurant and he stops dead in his tracks and will not move and then he barks and backs off Ooh, like like this and we think what is it what is it it was a little statue this high of like a peter pan type character bending over with his butt pointed to hugo and he flipped and we stayed there for probably 10 minutes before he got over it so again older puppy totally socialized as i feel like an owner now oh he was totally socialized or he was totally house trained well there's not such a word as total when it comes to your dog's you know strength of mind and his perceptions and how he's feeling and then after 10 minutes we came back the other way we had a minor reaction but he went up and sniffed it and we came back a few more times back and forth to check him and he was cool but we yeah. never expect these things, so how can you prepare for them? And that's the wonderful thing about having these, you know, parties for your puppy, and you tell people to come, bring children, and I like to have the children come on one day, uh, rather than to subject people who don't have kids to a bunch of kids. So all the kids are there, one parent per child, that's important. They all bring items. And we have silly times. You say, right, everyone clap your hands. Everyone sing. Everyone roll on the ground. And you can do so much all at once. Yeah. Um, we had a question from Ina about what do you recommend with Halloween coming up? And uh, we actually, we were doing the Essential Puppy Training course about this time last year with Halloween coming up. And definitely went out there, found some Halloween decorations. Um, and did some, you know, controlled troubleshooting before Halloween itself came around because Halloween itself, you don't have control about the, you know, level of intensity. And so as with all these things, it's, you know, if you can control how you introduce it, you can, you can do it in a preventative way and prevent getting spooked. And, and that's a great way to do it. In this next video clip I'm going to show where we take Eve on little field trips, um, we go to Home Depot and, uh, they have a bunch of Halloween decorations. So we exposed her to Halloween decorations in a big, you know, construction, uh, shop, but, um, I'll show this video and then we will get to, uh, people's questions. Sound good. All right. Today, Today we're going to eat eat out eat and about on the town, town for a field trip. Actually, we do that pretty much every day for at least 10 minutes a day, sometimes even twice a day for a few minutes if I'm doing errands. Uh, but today we are at the park and letting her absorb the sights and sounds of daily regular life.
So here we are at the cafe. Eve is in her bag, safe, from the city ground. So we've got our leash, her chew, my coffee. We're just gonna hang out and let her watch the world go by and you know, meet some people. She's met some people while we're sitting here. Time for another outing. Today we're going to the hardware store. Okay, so now we're at the pet store. I'm gonna put her in the cart with a towel so her legs don't fall through and to keep her clean and healthy. Did it end prematurely there? Oh. Hey there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that's so lovely. That again, safe. You know, you go to Main Street, dogs in a push car. Um, people come up, they pet it. All sorts of people, all sorts of noises. You couldn't, you know, we could buy sound tapes, but we could never create the real thing. Yeah, I was pretty impressed that we were able to find right a leaf blower, a chipper shredder, a freight train going by. I think you it saw it wasn't a freight that train. train. That was a passenger. Uh, passenger train. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You haven't we, uh, done freight train is still on your list. You didn't. Do freight it. train's still on the list. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I felt felt like we were able to find a lot of things. You know, made loud noises, interesting smells, um, and that's one of the things about going out in the world where you really can see some things you might not have ever thought that you need to have on your list. Um, of course, Kelly has a pretty long and comprehensive list as an experienced puppy trainer, but um, you know that was a, a, a large part of the goal of these videos in the Essential Puppy Training courses, and showing is, all the different things out in the world. You know, the thing is, socialization, you know, socializing puppies, it's like, a lot of people think it's, oh, God, it's a drag. No, this is fun. Like when you invite people to your house and you ask them to bring a friend and you can distance if you want, but they wear their little shoot covers, this is fun. It's, it's a thing called socializing. As you socialize the puppy, your social life will get back to normal again instead of, you know, spending all your day long answering texts or, you know, goggling the box or whatever it is yeah. um and going to main street having a cup of coffee watching the world go by i mean when these days do we ever take that time out in our lives just to sit and chill and hand feed the puppy of something remotely scary approaches it's so easy to do it's so much fun I can confirm that we had a bunch of fun during all of these uh, little field trips and all of the socialization exercises, the parties and the, the uh, exposing to novel stuff. Here, however, is a comment or a question from one of the, our viewers, which I think is probably something a few people have been thinking about because it's something that, you know, I've heard about out there. But the concept of a fear stage, uh, do, do puppies go through a fear stage where you need to be extra careful? about spooking them during socialization. Now, check out the webinar we did one month ago, was it, Jamie, about fear periods. Um, they, they don't exist. They, it's crazy. This is the one thing every breeder knows about, oh, the fear period. All right, let's go back and see where the word came from. It came from a study done in the 40s. Uh, I won't name the laboratory. Um, one of the worst studies I've ever seen in my life. Uh, number of the puppies died some were sick and and the study itself i'll explain it to you um they would 
introduce the puppy to a person wearing a white lab coat at the end of a corridor, put the puppy down, see what he did once a week. Then what they would do was, if the puppy ran up to the person, they would shock it. That was the study. Anyway, regardless of that horrible, it was a badly done study, but the experimenters concluded, therefore, there's a fear imprint period at 49 days of age. Well, any parent knows you can't predict even a tooth coming through to the day. So how could they predict a fear in period to the day? We're talking about development. No, what we have is, as I mentioned earlier, young animals have a universal tendency to approach anything within their immediate environment. Those things or those animals are usually only mum and litter mates. As they get older, the tendency to avoid gets stronger and stronger as the tendency to approach gets less and less. I think you have a graphic for this, right, Jamie, somewhere? Not today, but I, yes, no, I saw it. And so you get to a point where they cross over. It is about seven weeks that now the tendency to approach has decreased below the tendency to avoid. So when most owners get their puppy at eight weeks, yeah, avoidance is getting stronger than approaching, which means we have to lure the approaches and do things like clap our hands because he's already begun to avoid everything. The dog has bonded well with mum, litter mates, and the breeder, but you've got to get it now to bond to you so you become that familiar part of the immediate environment, except you also want it to bond to all people, hence puppy parties. So this whole fear period thing, it's basically saying to people, don't socialize now. That's what a lot of breeders say. Well, don't socialize now. Be careful what you do uh, with the extreme of silliness, the um, neurosensory ENS, environmental. The, yeah. Well, yeah. So the short answer is no. No. You don't need to worry about a few fear period. Thank you, Jamie. It's not really a thing. How do you have the ability funny? to take, you know, like several paragraphs of me talking, hopefully explain to people, and summarizing it with a single word, no. We don't have yes. fear period. But if at any time you see the dogs upset, deal with it. Conquer it now. You don't let it wait. Whatever it is, the dog's got to get on the horse again and ride off. Yeah, and it is unfortunate. The, the concept of the fear period is definitely out there in the culture, but really it's just puppies are becoming less uh, less eager to approach, less naturally confident as yeah. they get older and enter adolescence. All right, so let's see uh, if you have any questions. Uh, we can take a couple questions before Ian has to go. Uh, I think we had some that were already posted. So I'm gonna look back, but if you still have- While one, you're hunting, I do want to just say one thing. And, and this is the real shame that breeders aren't doing this in the kennel. Because as I said, the puppies will approach anything. But eight weeks, usually when the puppy says goodbye at the kennel now, already the tendency to avoid the unfamiliar is creeping in. And so all the exposure to sound tapes, uh, every uh, substrate you can think of, covering the floor, children especially, the puppy should meet them all prior to eight weeks. So I always feel that the new owner is usually a bit behind before they start because of the insufficient socialization in the breeding kennel. That's why we have the extreme urgency now. And you won't see that the puppy is scared until he's scared, until he's exposed to these things. So that's why you want to hit him with everything possible to check. And the more you do, the more you give the gift of confidence. And there's nothing for a dog better than to go through life with confidence. Or put it the other way, there's nothing worse than to have no confidence and have to meet the biggest nightmare people every day. Yeah. All right. Through, so, Jamie. <laughs> here, uh, we had a few people asking about recovering from a traumatic experience. Uh, April says she did everything she could to uh, properly socialize her puppy, 
But then at five months old, uh, the puppy had a traumatic experience and hasn't regained their confidence. Um, any tips or suggestions for rebuilding yeah, confidence? You see, number one, um, no one can do everything they should do. And number one, we never socialize dogs enough. Number two, you know, <laughs> I, 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 how should I put it? The notion that the dog had a traumatic experience and then we get this sudden and permanent change in its temperament um, isn't yet proven. Yeah, maybe someone shouted at the puppy or dropped it or what have you. You know, things happen. But the assumption of cause and effect isn't really, I think, a sound one. I would say what we're looking at is normal development. You got a puppy. You did lots and lots of socialization with it. Then your puppy, just like little Hugo, at 14 weeks, freaks out at seeing a not even a big stone statue like the one that, you know, the, the, the video you just saw met on 4th Street. This was a little stone statue. So the puppy freaked out. He had an extremely traumatic event. Well, I'm not leaving Calistoga till we've solved that. It did, and it took 10 minutes. Now, where that came from, I have no idea, because I would have said we did loads of socialization with this dog, with people. He had been through, once I go through and edit these videos of his puppy class, his puppy two class was unbelievable. I'm assuming the Right, but Dad, had you introduced him to any four-foot-tall, bending-over Peter Pan statue no. before? No, we missed that. There you go. It's a totally novel experience. Yeah. And so, you know, we have trauma in our lives. We, that's life. We deal with it. But what happens is a vicious circle starts. When someone thinks, oh, the dog will be scared of that, we tend to avoid it rather than mending it. You know, if you know there's one little thing that spooks your dog, that, um, next up would have been a museum, walking him in and showing him statue after statue after statue. But we got to resolve that fear. And the reason why I like Hugo's example, or the penguin, it, they are so bizarre. We wouldn't even think of this. Well, I would think the penguin may scare a dog as it may scare children or grown men, but not a little baby stone statue. It's not even moving. It doesn't smell of anything. And so I imagine that Hugo had a much better visual perception of the world than most dogs care about. Most dogs don't even look at the world. It all comes in through their nose. Um, yeah, I mean, in these examples that we're talking about, the the dog got the puppy got spooked, even though nothing actually they didn't get hurt, or you know, like you, it, it'd be easy to imagine a scenario where like Hugo's walking along and a you know statue falls over and lands on his tail and causes intense pain. That then that would you know like that would make sense to be afraid of something. Yeah. That, well, to, to put it another or... way, in a, a dog that's not sufficiently socialized, every novel stimulus is a traumatic experience. Does that explain the statue now? There's nothing. The statue didn't do anything to Hugo. It wasn't moving. It didn't smell. It's, it's, it's a non-event. But he spooked to it. And he was a well-socialized puppy. What we got to do when that happened, and that's why I like to throw everything at puppies as young as possible, preferably before, you know, they're five and six weeks old, because you can do a lot with noises there, you know, and get them used to it. Noises that would certainly fright, frighten a 10-week-old or a 12-week-old puppy will have no effect on a neonate or a four-week-old. But we must know what is it that upsets it. And, and to actually live in a culture where we have Halloween, July the 4th, or you live in Kansas where there's thunderstorms, not to expose all of this, to simulate a thunderstorm with all the noise tapes we have played at 100 decibels or, or what have you, you know, with lightning flashes, camera flashes going off and cymbals crashing. Um, it's too silly. So you've got to have that young neonate grow up like that. Imagine you lived in Kansas, you're going to a breeder and say, well, we've done our best to thunderproof these puppies 
when they were neonatal, you know, and that now they're pretty good at it. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Uh... Okay, Diane, right? Uh, another example has a Kangol. He got scared of a bird's feather on the floor. He stared at it and started growling. <laughs> oh, but so here's here's another example, right? Or another specific example: a dog that's a passenger in a car that's involved in a car accident. Mm -hmm. Then it would make a lot of sense to develop a fear of cars. Um, well, no, I would develop a fear of the driver. I mean, <laughs> let's be real. Well, here. <laughs> as we as we've learned, dogs can associate; they can spook on. Yeah and pick whatever stimulus uh happens to be salient at the moment but um i know you needed to say you need to get going right dad no i've got a few more minutes don't worry oh. okay oh i got five minutes yeah um so yeah when you you know it's a traumatic event because you could have been the driver you know or you were there or it happened now we've got to repair that damage you know um and uh you don't just say, right, puppy, in the car, we're now going for a long drive screaming round corners. You know, you could do it with a long, gentle drive, like I did with Omaha. I said, well, look, Omaha, in the car, uh, we're going to the mountains. 200 miles later, he got over his car phobia. He salivated, had a towel over my head. It was just keeping me dry. But after that, he wasn't scared again. But that's... You know, I wouldn't do it with a, a really excruciating stimulus. I would sit in the car. That's where the dog eats for the next week, in the car. Ignition off, car stationary, with the driver that crashed the dog sitting in the car beside him, hand-feeding him. So you separate all the stimuli. Like I, I loved it, Kelly, showing the dog Halloween costumes, but with no person in them. You know, that's wonderful. You break down the complexity of the stimulus, car, smell of car, strange person driving, sound of the car, vibration of the car, and impact. So you've got to separate all those and teach the dog, ah, the car that's not vibrating, doesn't, it's not turned on, doesn't sound, so it's just the smell, and we're going to have dinner here. Then we bring in the person who was the driver to hand feed the dinner. And then we then turn the ignition on, but the car is stationary. You get it bit by bit. You must get the dog over this. Why? Well, I could list you just off the top of my head 10 scenarios where if you don't, the dog could fall apart. Let's say your dog is vomiting or he's just been bitten by a rattlesnake and you put him in the car to drive to the vet. As soon as you get him in the car, he's not feeling good. He panics on top of a snake bite or having diarrhea, that's not conducive to, to healing or rushing him into the vet. Maybe you can't get him in the car now because the dog's a 150 pound dog. You can't pick him up, but he won't go in. So you must deal with every issue and we deal with it gently, progressively desensitizing the dog, desensitizing each stimulus at a time. And we're exactly the same principle as dog bites. A dog doesn't bite for one reason. A dog bites for usually half a dozen subliminal bite stimuli, bite triggers, if you like. You work with one at a time. So if it was a little boy he didn't know playing with a spooky toy that tripped and fell over and headbutted the dog while it was eating from its bowl, first you work with the little boy and feeding the dog, but he, the little boy is sitting on a chair and he's calm. Then you work with the spooky toys, you separate them all, then around the food bowl, okay, and so on and so on and so on. And that's the wonderful gift that the notion of subliminal bite stimuli did to us. Instead of working with an incomprehensible problem that we couldn't replicate safely, how can we ask a child, I'll run up to the dog, he's eating a bone and trip and headbutt him, because I want to progressively desensitize that. No, you pick each subliminal stimulus and you can work below threshold with it individually. Then you put two together, then three, then four and five. Having said that, Jamie, I do have to go now. I see the people are here for the meeting. Anyway, it's been fun. Um, I hope I don't have to talk about this again. This stuff is so simple. I'll summarize it in one sentence as young as possible with your puppy 
safely introduce him to as many people as possible. Different people have them each bring a friend, three weird things to carry, dress up in costumes and act weird. Do it safely. So there's no risk to parvo over puppies or COVID for people. All right. So I have to say goodbye. Oh, Jamie, good. fun always as pleasure. always. Enjoyed. This is the only way we seem to get together these days, the little chatting we do in, in the webinars. But that will change. That will change. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank for you, watching. everyone. Kelly, Yam, Helda. And yes, I, uh, next <laughs> the next live, I don't know exactly when it will be, but we will announce it uh, with a little more um, lead time than this one. I only posted this one yesterday. Sorry about the late notice. Oh, dear. Or watch this space, yeah. Yeah. Maybe right. I'll get back to Facebook as things start to slowly lighten up. I All right, and uh, for a year. Scott, I think it's about time for you to try out the Top Dog Academy. So you can try it out for free using the link on the screen. <laughs> All right. You never stop promoting, do you, Jamie? I love it. That's what we got to do. I'm English. I can't promote. Well, I certainly can't promote myself. We don't toot our own horn. All, right. all of you out there can toot for us, okay? Please. Yeah. Please toot. So, <laughs> toot for us. All right. I'm off. Oh, and if you liked if you liked this webinar, please give it a thumbs up in uh, YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're watching. We certainly appreciate the positive, uh, positive feedback. We like treats. All right. Bye, Dad. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank